algorithms. Algorithms. An algorithm is a sequence of procedural instructions to solve a problem. This is a very broad definition as there are many kinds of problems. This ranges from simple problems like list sorting, which are well studied in theoretical computer science, to more complex problems like animating some fluid dynamic simulation or training how to get word dominance once you read technological singularity. Okay, okay, let's keep it simple. Let's say that you have a list of users and you want to sort them alphabetically by their names. So in order to solve the problem, you just have to use the right sorting algorithm, right? Well, while that's not wrong, we still have a problem. There are many algorithms for sorting things. What we just showed, quick sort, there are also insertion sort, bubble sort, merge sort, select sort, shell sort, and many, many more. Now this back to the obvious question. What makes an algorithm good? There are basically two important things to look out for. Firstly, there's correctness. This one's pretty obvious. Given an input, the algorithm will give the correct output. But how does one show the algorithm is correct? That's pretty simple. Blah, 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 model checking, blah, 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 hua calculus, blah, 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 SMT solver. Anyways, secondly, their speed. How long does the algorithm take? How fast is it? Will my DAX algorithm beat your DAX algorithm? This is what we will focus on. But first, how do we measure speed? If you have never heard about the time complexity of an algorithm, please watch the great introduction called What is Big O Notation Made by Reducible? It will gently introduce you to the concept of time complexity and its notation via first principle reasoning. Lastly, you should also know the difference between Big O, Big Omega, and Big Theta. For this, Khan Academy has written a great introduction. As you have already read, this video will focus on the master theorem and its usefulness to a specific type of algorithm. Divide and conquer is a popular paradigm in algorithm design. A divide and conquer algorithm has three phases. Firstly, we have the divide phase, where you split up the problem into smaller sub-problems. Secondly, we have the conquer phase, where you solve each small problem. Lastly, we have the merge phase, where you merge these smaller problems into a whole solution. It is really simple. Let's say we have a huge problem that is enormously difficult to solve. Instead of trying to solve the whole problem at once, we first try to solve a smaller problem. This is the divide step. If that is too difficult, we divide it up even further. We do that until the problem is small enough to conquer trivially. Now, the small problems are easy enough to solve themselves. Lastly, we only have to merge the smaller solutions to the solution of our whole problem. Let us now analyze it more rigorously. Look at this graph. We have any generic divide and conquer algorithm and want to find out its time complexity for a given input size, which we normally denote as the time function of input size n. Let's say that we divide it into b even subproblems. We also have some merging work to join the smaller subproblems together, which we normally denote as c of n for a cost function given size n. Lastly, to keep it more generic, let's allow the branching factor to be independent from the input size decrease. To make it more clearer, let's play it out how it would actually look. At the start, we have our normal recursive function. Now we apply the recursion and divide it up into subproblems, thus only having the merging cost at the top. Now, if the problem is still too big, we divide it again. This goes on and on. At some time, the problem gets small enough to be conquered directly. For us, it's enough that the problem is solvable in constant time. Again, we want to find out how fast our algorithm is just by looking at the divide and conquer recursion. Let us further analyze the tree. What is the depth of our tree? We stop once the input size becomes trivial, let's say when it becomes 1. Every level, the divisor grows exponentially. So the depth is the inverse exponential function of the, to the basis of b, which is the logarithm with basis b. Next, how many leaves does the tree have? Again, looking at the formula, it exponentially grows with the basis a every level. So a to the power of the height, which is a to the power of log bn. This is the same as n to the power of log ba. We now know everything we need to analyze the recursion. Let's start to get a feeling how the total work changes each level. The first level is easy as we have only one node. On the next level, each node has a work of c of n divided by b. How many of those do we have? Obviously a because it's a branching factor. Next level. Each node has a work of c of n divided by b squared. We again have a branching factor of a, but this counts for all parent nodes of which we have a as well, thus a squared. This goes on and on. In the bottom level we have theta of 1 for each leaf. 
we know we have n to the power of log ba of them. This can be simplified to a theta of n to the power of log ba. From this, we can find a closed form of the recursion. Let's just write it out. So cn for the first level, a times c of n divided by b for the second level, a squared times c of n divided by b squared for the third level, and so on and so forth, until we have theta of n to the power of log ba in the last level. Lastly, we can simplify this to a sum, and we can remove the brackets by reordering it. Okay, 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 okay. Now here's the real banger. Let me tell you the secret the lazy computer scientists don't want you to know about. Remember the big theta thingy? We only need the biggest factor. Back to the analysis. We only have to find out which level the biggest factor is in. We basically have three choices. First case, the problem gets easier with each level. The root is the hardest level. We can hide everything else. Thus, t of n equals to the work done in the root, which is c of n. Second case, the problem gets harder with each level. The leaves are the hardest level. We can hide everything else. Thus, t of n equals to the work done in the leaves, which is theta of n to the power of log ba. Third case, each level is equally hard. We can hide nothing in notation. t of n equals to the height times the work of some level. We know that the height is log bn. Let's choose the leaf level, which again is theta n to the power of log ba. This is the master theorem. The rest is only mathy noise. Okay, now with the formal noise. So, let our recursion be a times t of n over b plus c of n with some formal constraints. Now, remember the three cases. First case, if the work gets more, the important factors are the leaves. This is the same as the following. If c of n is polynomially smaller than the work in the leaves, then the important factors are the leaves. Second case, if the work is distributed evenly between the levels, then the total work is the work of one level times the height. Third case, if the work each level becomes polynomially smaller, then the important factor is the root. That is the full master theorem. In my humble opinion, it doesn't get much cooler than that. Now let's apply it in the real world. Merge sort is a pretty performant divide and conquer based sorting algorithm. Let us sort some numbers by ascending order. The list is still too big, let's split it up into two problems. Let us focus on the left part first. Still too hard, we split again. Sorting two numbers seems pretty doable. Let's check out the first numbers. They are not sorted, let's sort them. Next two also have to be sorted. Let's look at the right part. Again, too hard for us, let's split it up. Are the first two numbers sorted? Yes. The last one is automatically sorted. Now we have our partial solutions, which are sorted. We only have to merge them now. Let us start at the left side. We know those two sublists are sorted. So the leftmost position is always the locally smallest. To merge the two sublists, we just take the global minimum of those two, which is 3. 3 is at the right place, so now we compare 27 and 43. Obviously, 27 is smaller. So we have to compare 38 and 43 next. You get the idea. We do this until all numbers are green. Same idea for the right side. You just always choose the smallest available number. We do this for each step of the recursion. After the last step, we have successfully merged our partial solutions to the fully sorted array. But now, let's figure out how fast the algorithm is. Again, let us find out how the recursion formula looks. We split up into two subproblems, so our branching factor A is 2. We divide it up into half length, so our splitting factor B is 2 as well. For the merging step, we have two n comparisons, so theta n is accurate enough. Now we have to compare the root work to the number of leaves. Let us calculate the number of leaves. Again, we know that the branching and splitting factors are 2. So n to the power of 1 equals theta n, which means that all levels are equally hard. So second case of the master theorem applies. Sticking in all values, then simplifying, we get theta of n log n. Next example. Binary search, really fast for searching in an already sorted list. So we have some sorted numbers. Let's say we want to find the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe and everything. We know that it is sorted, so we can first ask, is the number on the left or the right half? We find this out by looking at the middle numbers and check out whether our number is smaller or larger. In this case, 43 is bigger than 13, so we only have to look at the right side. Now, recursively, is it on the left or the right side? 42 is smaller than 44, so we only have to look at the left side. Lastly, we look at 42 directly and we have found it. We do not have to merge anything because we don't walk up the tree again. That was binary search. Next, to the analysis. Same basic recursive formula. This time, we only branch out one time. 
the work gets split up in half again. And there's no merging words with technically is constant work, thus theta of 1. Now let's compare the merging work with the number of leaves. Pretty sure one could do that without the formula, but let's go through the rigor anyways. We have a branching factor of 1, a splitting factor of 2, so we get log 2 of 1. Any logarithm of 1 is 0. n to the power of 0 is constant as well, thus the work is evenly hard in each level. Let's plug in the numbers. So log 2 of 1, which is n to the power of 0, thus binary search takes log n time. If you think this was fun, we have way, way more examples. Help! Help! This video is already way too long. In case you want to see more advanced and even cooler applications, here you go. Niemann has a great visualization on the current super often algorithm for multiplying numbers in faster than quadratic time without using any FFT. Side note, the Tom Cook generalization is provable with the Master Theorem as well. The MIT has a great visual lecture on divide and conquer based convex hull algorithms. It's a great watch and very worth your time. Speaking of convex hulls, by computing a higher dimensional convex hull, one can also get the Delaunay triangulation. Those are pretty important for computer graphics and finite element meshes if you are into that. But it gets even cooler than that. By having the Delaunay triangulation, one also gets the dual graph the Voronoi regions. Those are pretty cool for many reasons, for example for analyzing football games or for procedurally generating noise as used in my bachelor thesis. The fast Fourier transformation is the most important algorithm in all of computational science. It's used basically everywhere, and Eric Domain once described it even as them called the fast Fourier transform. It's probably the most taught algorithm at MIT. It's used in all sorts of contexts, uh, especially digital signal processing, like MP3 compression, all sorts of things. Here's a great visualization by Reducible on how it works, and another one on the magic behind its root of unity. Lastly, just for reference. Van der Boer's trees, which are used everywhere in networking, can be proven with the Master Theorem. Here's an MIT lecture. Here's a great visualization for an algorithm on finding the two nearest points in the point cloud. Again, provable with the Master Theorem. I don't even know anymore. The stress and matrix multiplication method has a neat proof, I guess.